When I first heard about Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or MCMC, I'll admit I was pretty intimidated by the topic. However, as I began to get more experience with it, I came to realize that behind its deep mathematical theory, the method's actually quite intuitive. And not only that, it's extremely powerful and it comes up all over the place in machine learning and statistics. So in this video, I hope to give you an intuitive and beginner-friendly understanding of Markov Chain Monte Carlo so that you can begin to take advantage of this powerful technique. To build some intuition to get started, I want to brainstorm a bit how you as a human might try to solve the task that MCMC solves. So here's the setup. We're given some probability density, and we're told to produce a set of samples that look like they come from this density. To test this out, I built this interactive widget that allows me to click on the axis where I would like to add a sample. So as you watch me try this out myself, think about how you would solve this task. My strategy here is to put most of the samples in regions where the density is high, but every once in a while, I also want to put samples in low density regions too. And the frequency with which I do this is dependent on how high or low the density is. We're going to put that demo aside for now, but I want you to keep that intuition in mind as we begin to discuss how MCMC performs the same task. So here's what the MCMC algorithm looks like as it performs the same task. In general, it appears to have a pretty similar strategy. It's selecting samples in high density regions more often than in low density regions, and after a bit, it's beginning to look like it's converging to the correct density. Let's dive a little deeper to see what's going on under the hood here. MCMC works by creating a Markov chain of samples. A Markov chain is simply a chain of samples in which the next sample in the chain depends only on the value of the previous sample. MCMC builds up this chain in such a way that when we collapse it down, the samples in the chain appear to have come from the probability density we selected. To make this seem a little less like magic, let's talk about the steps we use to build this chain. We start with some initial point, which we'll call x, and then we use x to create a kernel, which is simply a probability distribution that we know how to sample from. A common kernel people use is a Gaussian kernel, like the one shown here, which just centers a Gaussian distribution at x. Then, we draw a sample from this kernel to produce a new proposed sample, which we call x prime. At this point, we have two options. We can either add x prime to the chain or stay at x for another iteration. To make this decision, we bring back the target density we want to sample from and look at the values corresponding to x and x prime. Based on these values, we refer to a set of chain creation rules to make our decision. The first rule tells us that if the density of our proposed point is higher than the density of our current point, in other words, it's more likely, we should accept it. Since this is currently the case, we accept the proposed point x prime and add it to the chain. We then continue to build the chain starting from this new point. We create our kernel function centered at the new point, sample a new proposed point, look at the density values, and refer back to our chain creation rules. This time, the proposed point has a lower density than the current point. So we move on to the second rule, which says that we should accept this proposed point with probability proportional to how much less likely it is. So in this case, we should accept it with probability 0.15. One simple way to do this is to sample a random number between 0 and 1 and accept the sample if that number is less than 0.15. In this case, our sample tells us to accept. So we accept the proposed sample and add it as the next point in the chain. We repeat this process again for the next sample. Form the kernel, draw a proposed sample from the kernel, evaluate the densities, and refer back to the rules. In this case, we're back to rule two, but this time with an acceptance probability of 0.09. This time, when we draw a random number between 0 and 1, we get a value that's greater than 0.09, and therefore we reject the sample. Whenever we reject a sample, we simply add the current sample again as the next point in the chain. We can then continue to build up the chain, always following these two simple rules. Once we have enough samples in the chain, we can collapse it down 
and the samples will look as though they were drawn from our target density. I don't know about you, but to me, it's pretty mind-blowing to actually see this work. But let's take a bit more of the mystery out of it and get some more intuition for what's really going on by examining the chain creation rules more closely. Looking at the first rule, it essentially says that if the proposed sample has higher density than the current sample, we should always accept it. If the proposed sample has a lower density, we should accept it with frequency proportional to how much lower. So in other words, the first rule encourages us to sample in high density regions, and the second rule makes sure that we still sometimes sample in low density regions. This exactly matches the intuition that we got from our demo. While this is in no way a mathematical proof that this works, you can consult a stats textbook for that one, it turns out that this algorithm will converge to the target distribution in the limit of infinite samples. And in general, the more samples we produce, the closer we get to our target distribution. This is pretty cool, but there's still one problem. We only converge to the target distribution in the limit of infinite samples. And unfortunately, we don't have an infinite amount of time to run our MCMC chain. So in practice, we're always dealing with a finite sample size. However, we can still make MCMC work well in practice. Sometimes we just need a few extra tricks to deal with this finite sample size. To illustrate one potential problem with a finite sample size, consider this target density function, which is quite low in most places, with one narrow region of high density. If we initialize our MCMC outside the region of high density, we have some issues with the beginning of our chain. Specifically, the first few samples don't look very representative of the target density. If we were to continue to collect more samples, the influence of these initial samples will decrease, and in the limit of infinite samples, they'll have no impact at all. But when we have a finite sample size, sometimes it's easier to just throw out the first few samples to avoid this problem. For this reason, in practice, MCMC algorithms often use what's called a burn-in period in which the first few samples just don't count. A burn-in period is just one of the many MCMC tricks researchers have come up with. Another common trick is called thinning. The need for thinning arises due to the fact that we use a Markov chain to produce the samples. Since each sample in the Markov chain depends on its previous sample, the samples in the chain are correlated. To decrease the amount of correlation in the samples, it's common to throw out some intermediate samples in a process known as thinning. The final trick I want to talk about has to do with the kernel. It turns out that the performance of MCMC for finite sample sizes is highly dependent on the choice of kernel. There are lots of creative ways to select this kernel though, especially if you have access to the gradient of the density function. You may have heard the names of methods like Mala, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, and many others, all of which rely on cleverly crafted kernels to improve the efficiency of MCMC. It turns out that these tricks are particularly useful when we want to draw samples from complex, high-dimensional probability distributions. In fact, MCMC really starts to shine as we scale our Markov chains beyond just a single dimension. Even despite these mind-blowing demos, you might still be wondering what all the hype is about. To explain the full power of MCMC, we must examine some properties of valid probability distributions. For a function p of x to represent a valid probability distribution, two properties must hold. First, p of x must always be greater than zero, and second, p of x must integrate to one. Let's focus on the second property and consider the function we've been using as an example so far. To determine a valid probability density function from this function, we must ensure that it integrates to 1. With some mathematical manipulation, we can see that to make it a valid probability density function, we must divide by its integral over all real numbers. In fact, probability density functions are often written this way, with the unnormalized density function on top and the normalizing constant on the bottom. However, computing this normalizing constant often requires computing a pretty tough integral. For example, when we write our current example in this form, we get a pretty nasty looking integral in the denominator. The good news is that the normalizing constant is just that, a constant. While changing its value changes the scale of the function, it does not affect its overall shape. 
More importantly, this constant does not affect the relative density of different points, which is all we needed to know for our chain creation rules. Therefore, we can apply MCMC to sample from unnormalized densities. And it turns out being able to do this gives us great power. For example, the famous Bayes rule is often written with a hard to compute integral in the denominator. MCMC allows us to sample from the posterior distribution without having to compute this denominator. And in general, the need to draw samples from unnormalized densities comes up all over the place in ML and statistics. So I hope next time it comes up for you, you'll be able to carry some of this intuition with you and apply Markov chain Monte Carlo.